morning. Welcome back to Orange Coast Community Church. Welcome back. Welcome back. Yeah. Um, today's message is about, um, pastor's going to be speaking about tempering your temper. And I'm excited to hear about that. We, I'm not sure what to expect. Um, and some of the notes are about our, our holiness and personal righteousness. And I'll just share real quick that the last few weeks I had to ask for prayer from my worship team and from other people. And the Bible does say to, um, let me pull it up here. In James, he says, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. A prayer of a righteous person, when it is brought about, can accomplish much. And, and if you don't have anybody to pray with, or you, you feel like you can't pray, or you feeling like asking, afraid to ask somebody to pray for you, just, I want to tell you to do it. <laughs> just, if you don't trust anybody, you can come to one of us. We'll pray with you and, um, and just accept that and blessing and, and trust. And in return, you can also do the same for someone else one day. Um, and our, our righteousness doesn't come from ourselves. It comes from the blood of Christ who washes us clean. Amen. So please stand and join us and uh, we'll worship.
Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Lands empty, praise and treasures that fade were never enough. And you came along and you put me back together. And every desire. Is now satisfied hearing your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you.
Harvest Crusade is coming up July 1st to 2nd. We have bumper stickers back there for you or any other material to kind of promote this event that's coming up in just about a month, July 1st and 2nd. Be sure to check the kiosk behind us over there. Um, I want to thank you all and Christina too for the uh, gifts and the cards to celebrate our 25th wedding anniversary. That was very special for us. If you've looked at the back of your bulletin, we have readjusted the numbers, and I know that they're kind of shocking. Uh, our weekly amount is $7,900 a week, which is astronomical and way too much for our church. It represents the insane rising of our rent, and it continues to go up. And the good news is that won't be forever. That won't be forever. And so... Um, if we, by some miracle, are able to stay here, and we'll know that in the next month, then the first thing we will do is get another church in to help us substantially with that amount, to drop that down so that we could make it. If we don't do that, the good news is if we leave here by the 1st of December, then we are searching, I am searching actively for a place that uh, will cause us to pay substantially less than we're paying right now, something that's more reasonable for a size of our congregation. Um, recently talking with a person who is an expert uh, when it comes to um, real estate, and particularly this type of real estate, he has agreed that what we're paying is astronomical and not reasonable at all. So uh, right now, we're in the thick of it, and right now, we cannot expect a church of this size to pay $7,900 a week. Uh, we have money uh, in savings and investments, but that is being drained on a weekly basis. So that's the truth. That's where we're at right now. And um, we wish that weren't true, but it is. So we're going to ask you to do two things. Number one, give what you can. As God lays on your heart uh, giving, and you could give a little bit more here and there, that's always helpful, and God will do that during this time. Secondly, pray. We have seen throughout the history of this church times in which we were in straits like this or even worse financial straits, and God motivated people to give large, substantial gifts to get us through that. You know, you think that's a strange thing to ask those who have more money to give. It is a biblical thing, a biblical thing. Paul tells us in the sixth chapter of 1 Timothy, instruct those who are doing well financially to give lots of money to keep the church going because that way it's an investment, he says, into eternity. And so if you can give, give. Secondly, pray for those who have the ability inside or outside this church who watch us to give substantially and hang on to the good news that we're going to get there. It's going to be better. And so when you look at those numbers, try not to become discouraged. Realize this is a temporary time, and we're going to be making some adjustments with either bringing a second church in or moving to a location that is far, far more reasonable than what we're paying right now. Amen? Amen. So let's bow together for prayer. Father, we thank you. You're the God of the impossible. I was sharing with the worship team in prayer just moments ago that uh, the history of Israel and the history of the church has been for you to back the people up against the Red Sea, to put the chief apostle in prison in Acts chapter 12, and put him in circumstances that were beyond unbelievable, and then you step in and do something miraculous. And so we're trusting you to be our miracle-working God. You've always taken care of Orange Coast, but now it's up to us to step up. And if we can step up financially, wonderful. And if we can't step up financially, we can step up by remembering every day in prayer the financial needs of Orange Coast. Because there are people who can give. There are situations which can be rectified. We thank you for the regular giving over the years, and it's going to carry us through this time but we're praying again that you instruct us. Lord, in this next month, by the 1st of July, we will know whether or not we can be here. And if we are going to be here, then show us the perfect church that will come in and can share the facility with us. If that's not going to happen, 
then lead us to the ideal location, which is far more financially feasible than what we're in right now. We trust you to see us through this time. Help us to take this seriously. Help us to be talking to you daily about this. We fasted. We came to you. We've asked for direction. And so far, you have not given us that direction. So far, the heavens have been like brass. And so we're going to continue to lean on you, continue to love you, continue to turn to you until you give us clear answers to the crisis that we're in. We love you. We know you care for this church. You've performed many, many, many miracles in the lives of people in the 17 years in which we have been in this location. So you've used us in this situation. Use us today. Use us in the future. This is the weekend in which we celebrate those who have served you in the armed forces, men and women who have basically given their lives to keep this nation free. And today we thank you for all of those who made those sacrifices, those who died and those like my dad lived through three wars, but made the sacrifices with his family and other areas. Thank you so much for men and women who right now are putting themselves in harm's way and serving. Just like you put yourself in harm's way, knowing that you would be executed on a cruel cross but that sacrifice has produced life and love and happiness for us. So today we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for the sacrifice of men and women who have given to this country. And we thank you for the sacrifices that we will make, either financially or time spent in prayer on a daily basis. And we look with expectation to the answers that you will provide us as a church Thank you for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Lucky. Thank you for, uh, hey, thank you for sharing with us. Amen. Some house cleaning. <laughs> so, Elder Mel and myself are going to be reading from Proverbs. Are we reading first, correct? Uh, you want to? All right. And, uh, Pastor, we're going to read these. And, uh, Pastor has promised us that there is some good news coming somewhere at the end of this. <laughs> so, just hang on and, and praise the Lord. I'm going to be reading Proverbs. Chapter 14, verse 17, and Proverbs chapter 14, verse 29 through 30. A quick-tempered man acts foolishly, and a man of evil devices is hated. He who is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who is quick-tempered exalts folly. A tranquil heart is life to the body, but passion is is rottenness to the bone. <laughs> Always. Okay, turning further to the left, I'll be reading from Proverbs 19, verse 19. A man of great anger will bear the, pen bear the penalty. For if you rescue him, you will have to do it again. And then further uh, to the right, we will go to Proverbs 21, verse 9. It is better to live in the corner of a roof than in a house shared with a contentious woman. <laughs> I, I, I just read that, okay? <laughs> and then further to the left again, in Proverbs 22, verse 24, do not associate with a man given to anger <laughs> or, go, or go with a hot-tempered man. Amen. And keep all those things in context. <laughs> Let's bow together for prayer. Thank you for the honesty of Solomon and that he speaks to every topic under the sun. Next week, we'll be talking about alcohol. Today, we're talking about anger. These are subjects that we deal with on a weekly, a daily, sometimes, as we talked last week about the tongue, on a second-by-second -second basis. So you have deemed it wise to provide wisdom from heaven inspiring the pen of the sharpest man who ever lived to give us great insight. And we're going to see that expanded with other verses as well in Scripture that will talk about the importance of anger in our lives. Help us to have a sense of balance on this topic. Uh, Christians tend to be afraid of anger. They tend to think that any anger uh, expression is sinful. We're going to see today, Lord, that that's not what your Bible teaches but there is anger that is sinful. So help us to get a good balance on this and to walk out of here um, convicted in areas in which we need to be, but also encouraged uh, overall, knowing that you're working with us when it comes to our tempers, when it comes to the way that we express our emotions. Teach us today from the pen of Solomon, we ask in Christ's name, amen. Stephen Scott writes, have you ever been caught in an unexpected downpour? Last year I was. Driving on a highway, one opened up out of nowhere. My windshield wipers at highest speed, I could not see five feet in front of the car. I had to pull off the road and wait it out. But a senior at her high school was not so fortunate. Her car hydroplaned, hit a concrete wall, killing her instantly. Floods are even more overwhelming. They could destroy whatever is in their paths, roads, bridges, buildings, and lives. This is the true nature of anger that's out of control. It starts like a light rain, turns into an extreme downpour. Like a tsunami, 
It comes out of nowhere and overwhelms anything in its path. Take, for instance, Joe. Joe is a 26-year-old machinist. One thing for sure, he has no trouble expressing his feelings. He makes it quite clear whenever he's angry, a little too clear. Everyone was aware of that fact when he was hostile, when he broke his guitar into a thousand pieces because a friend criticized his playing. His son knew he was angry because he accidentally left his bike once in the driveway and his dad drove over it and ruined it. His wife was aware of his anger when he broke windows, doors, dishes, and furniture. Now, Joe was applying a theory that's been popular for a number of decades in our country. The theory is just get your feelings out. Just express your anger in any old way, and you're bound to feel better. The problem is it's not true in Joe's case. The man is often miserable and frequently on the brink of suicide. That's what happens when you embrace and become addicted to an avalanche of anger. James 1.20, be slow to anger. Doesn't say don't be angry. It says be slow to anger because the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Now, having stated that, we recognize not all anger is wrong. Twice at the commencement of his ministry, John chapter 2, at the conclusion of his ministry, Matthew 21, twice he stepped into the temple, turned over tables, fashioned a whip, and demonstrated the fury of his father towards the sins of the people at that day. We're told in Psalm 711, easy to remember that one, 711, God is angry with the wicked every day. Now, when you look at the wicked that's taking place and the evil that we hear of, we've heard of this past week, what's happened at Target, what's happening in the baseball diamonds, we look at this evil and you wonder, what does God think about it? God's angry about that. He's angry every day. You go, is he a little upset? Well, the word for anger is the word om, and it means to foam at the mouth. Here's what the Bible says, God foams at the mouth at the unrighteous every single day. He's storing this up, and it's going to be poured out on this planet during the days of the Great Tribulation. And during that time, we read in Revelation chapter 14, 10, if anyone worships the beast and receives a mark on his or her forehead or hand, this person will drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in the full strength of his cup of anger. Now, that's a frightening statement. The word for wrath is the Greek word thumos, the most intensified term for anger found in the pages of the Bible. And it refers to an act of violence, an act of violence, from thumos, we get thermometer. It measures the rise in heat or the rise in temperature. We would call this righteous indignation. God is methodically storing up his anger and will for seven years on this planet begin to pour it out on the unrighteous who have rejected his son and rejected his standards of morality. So don't become too upset over what's happening in the world today. Pray for that. Take stances to state the truth and realize God has it in control. He will deal with it. Now, the word thumos, which is used of God, is prohibited for people in Ephesians chapter 4 and James chapter 1. So we are not to demonstrate a thumos type of anger in which we explode and do crazy things. But we are commanded to demonstrate a form of anger called orge. It's found in Ephesians 4 and verse 26, be orge. It's a command. I command you to be angry and yet do not sin. You say, well, if I can't explode, then what is he talking about? 
what's the righteous kind of anger? Well, the righteous anger of orge is to state it. Here's the good thing to do. When you feel angry, say it. I'm angry. I didn't like what you did here. That bothered me, that person cut me off. That wasn't right. It's okay to state it. It's biblical to feel it. But you don't want to feed it. Because if you foster it, then you fall into the sins of anger, which is inwardly resentment or outwardly rage. Now, I've been in Christian churches for 58 years, and I know that rage is not popular in churches. It is in the world. And so the Christians look at that anger and are terrified of it, and so they push it down. And they develop an anger that's just as bad as rage. It's called resentment. It's when you sit on it. It's when you won't look at it, and you won't state it, and you won't address it. Consequently, as we're going to see today, it comes out in various ways. It's best to feel it. It's best to state it. It's best to express it without going too far. Now, that's what Solomon's going to teach us to do today. And he's been speaking on all topics from both a negative and a positive perspective. So today, let's begin on the outline by examining the toxic side of a flared temper. The toxic side of a flared temper. And say it with me when it pops up. This is when you are frustrated and furious. We've all been there. Frustrated and furious. Look at chapter 14 and verse 17. <clears throat> a quick-tempered man acts foolishly. A man of evil devices is hated. This verse addresses the passion, quick temper, and the deliberate purpose, evil devices, the gust and the sudden destructive storm. Now, one of the godliest men who ever lived, the only man in Scripture who is said to have been a man after God's own heart was David. And David had problems with this kind of anger on occasion. In 1 Samuel chapter 25, he and his men provide a protection service for Nabal's shepherds. They could focus on shearing the sheep. David and his men defend the flock from wolves and thieves. <clears throat> well, when they eventually cash in in their investments, David sends his men <clears throat> to pick up the checks. When they come by to get their cash, Nabal says, David, who's he? No one's been taking care of our sheep. I'm not paying that bill. And the Bible says, David went off the Richter scale. Not with those words, those are mine. But 1 Samuel 25, 14, David told 400 of his men, put your swords on, we're going to put this man down. 400 swords for one man. That's a lot. That may be overkill. A man was walking down the road one day in a country setting with a pitchfork on his shoulder, and here comes a wild dog, and he leaps at him with his fangs. So the man takes the pitchfork and he runs him through and kills him on the spot. The owner of the dog comes by and saying, why did you kill my dog? He said, because he came at me with his fangs. And the owner said, well, why didn't you come at him with the other end of the pitchfork? And he said, well, why didn't your dog come at me with his other end? <laughs> He bears his fangs, he gets the fork. Nabal shows his teeth, David pulls his sword, all 400 of them, which is too much anger. It's a thumos kind of anger. And so consequently, it was going to be a major bloodbath until Minnie Mouse, Nabal's wife, Abigail, saves the day and tones down the temper of David. Now, we have to be careful with the gusts to flow out. And the reason why is because sin could grow from weakness to willfulness. The first makes a person contemptible. The second makes the person abominable. Think of the first boy born on planet Earth. He had a problem with anger. 
Isn't that interesting? The first boy born, purity should be reigning. There's been no sin except for the one thing his parents have done, and instantly there's a boy that's just full of rage. Instantly, right off the bat. And that's Cain. Now, when we look at Cain's anger towards his brother, we can't condone it, but we can identify with it. We can realize why he's angry. God is showing favor to Abel, right? That doesn't seem fair to Cain. God has righteous reasons. Cain doesn't like it. So we could identify with his anger until he butchers his brother in cold blood. You think he went a little bit too far? Yes. Just a little bit. That's what happened. He went from contemptible to abominable. He defied reason with his rage. Chapter 14, 29 to 30. He who is slow to anger has great understanding. He who is quick-tempered exalts folly. A tranquil heart, oh, that's life to the body. And we'll talk about that soon. Passion is rottenness to the bones. Passion promotes rage, and rage could be expressed. Rage could be repressed. And when it's repressed and pushed down, it affects the bones. It affects the structure of an individual. It's super dangerous to your health. Tom is a 54-year-old CPA, has a happy home life, involved in community fairs. He appears to be at peace, but he lives with hypertension. He got off the phone with an IRS agent and experienced severe chest pains was rushed to the hospital, had a major heart attack, and almost died. His coronary disease was aggravated by repressed anger. Repressed anger. Tom is one of 36,000 people in America who die every year of a heart attack specifically created by repression of their feelings. 36,000. It's been established that anger can cause a fatal heart rhythm called ventricular fibrillation. Also, it accelerates coagulation, which creates blood clots, which block a vessel and create death in individuals all the time. Hostility also raises a person's cholesterol level. The bad LDL cholesterol goes up the good HDL goes down. Anger that is suppressed, and of course, as I've said, this is the common sin of the Christian church because we're afraid to talk about anger, but we suppress it, we push it under, could lead to various sicknesses. Would you like to hear the list? Here it is. Colitis, eating disorders, digestive problems, TMJ, Lower back pain, headaches, hives, asthma, obesity, dermatological conditions, sexual difficulties, fatigue, sleep disorders, and susceptibility to infections. Wow. I wonder if America would be healthier if we learned how to handle our anger better. I think it'd be true for the world. Chapter 15 in verse... 18, the first part, a hot-tempered man stirs up strife, stirs it up, gets it going. My daughter Laurel is going to be, I think, 42 this year. She's living in the Washington, D.C. with her husband and daughter. When she was five, I recall going to the video store. Remember the good old days when they had video stores? I don't know what they've done to our society, but I like walking in and renting something for just a night. And so we would look through the store for something that a five-year-old could watch. And so I said, go find something that's good for kids. And about two minutes later, she goes, Dad, I found one. Which one is it? She goes, it's a picture of a little girl in the front. It was a picture of the young actress at that time, Drew Barrymore. And the title of the film was Fire Starter. It's about a little girl who, whenever she gets angry, she sets her enemies on fire with her eyes. 
I said, honey, maybe we should get a different film than that one to watch. The fire starter is the Christian who holds in the anger and incinerates friendships and relationships. Sometimes people who are highly cynical are people who are stuffing their anger. Oftentimes people who are irritated by all kinds of things in life are demonstrating to us they're repressing their anger. We need to learn to express it appropriately, not in a rageful or resentful way. Chapter 19 and verse 19. Let's turn there. It's an interesting statement. We're going to take a few moments to unpack this one. It was read by one of our elders today. A man of great anger will bear the penalty. If you rescue him, you only have to do it again. You know, Cain killed Abel. God put a punishment on Cain. And what was Cain's response? Genesis 14, 13. My punishment is too great to bear. And God said, you'll bear it. You'll bear it. And based on that, I think that Solomon is siphoning that thought out when it comes to anger. And he's telling us this. The person who is perpetually fuming, not the person who occasionally gets angry, but is perpetually fuming and living a life looking for an opportunity to get angry, flying off the handle, must experience from God's perspective the sadness and shame that goes along with their anger. If you don't allow them to experience that, they will continue to repeat the patterns of rage again and again and again. If there's no sadness, if there's no sense of shame, if there's no conviction, if there's no forgiveness or, or uh, confession of the anger, then the person has no reason to stop it. They're going to continue to demonstrate it. And that's why the Bible says they must bear it. Now, what happens for most people, it's probably true for all people. People who are seeping out with resentment or exploding with rage are people who are not dealing with stimulus in the moment. They're hooking into things that have happened over many, many years. Maybe they've been hurt. Maybe they've been abused. Maybe they've been mistreated. And unfortunate things have happened, and so they've stored up this anger. There's a second maybe for the past. Maybe none of those things happened to the person, but they were raised by parents who indulged them and gave them every single thing they wanted. And we have tons of parents doing that today. Never disciplined, never spanked, no consequences. And so they live their life in a continual temper tantrum. Making others suffer because they're accustomed to demonstrating inappropriate anger. Gary Smalley, who went to be with the Lord a few years ago, writes these words. When you're in a relationship with someone who retains old anger that predates your friendship, you could feel as if you've just eaten at a restaurant and after your meal, you were handed a bill for $10,000. You explain to the waiter, I'm not paying this bill. There's no way I could eat this much. Then the waiter says, well, your bill is $10,000 because we want you to pay for everyone who's eaten here today. Is that okay with you? <laughs> no, that's not okay with me. That's exactly what people do when they hold too much anger inside. They make others, often their spouses, pay the bill for those in the past who offended them. One of the greatest gifts of grace you could give a person is to refuse to pay their emotional bill. Do not do it. Do not rescue the person who is enraged. Chapter 21 and verse 9. That's the one the ladies did not like. <laughs> it is better to live in the corner of a roof than in a house 
with a contentious woman. J. Vernon McGee had some words on this verse. This is the man who did not know what true happiness was until they got married, and then it was too late. <laughs> he said, down in Nashville, Tennessee, the retired pastor of a church and I would repeatedly go down to the jail to get a man out who was a member of the church. He'd be arrested again and again and again for drunkenness. One time the retired preacher said something to me that I'll never forget. He said, Jay Vernon, if I were married to the woman he's married to, I'd get drunk too. Wow. Living with an angry spouse could drive a person to drinking. That's why Solomon said, it is better to live on a porch <laughs> where there's peace than in a 10,000 square foot mansion where there's constant tension. Chapter 22, verse 24. Uh, Proverbs 22, 24. Here's a solution. Do not associate with the man. See, ladies, he evens it out, ladies and men. Do not associate with the man given to anger or go with a hot-tempered person. Don't develop a fellowship with the person who is always angry. I had a fellowship with the person for many, many years. He was a friend. And eventually I had to wake up and cut that friendship off because the person was constantly angry. And being around him tended to make me angry. So if you have a friend or a relative who's always angry, God would tell you, pull away. Pull away. It's not a good thing. There's a simple solution for friendships and for relationships in the home. If you have a friend or if you have a mate who starts raging, what's your solution? Start running. <laughs> I'm taking off. You watch the kids, you figure it out, I'm out of here, and you get in the car and you drive. And you get out of there. Because if you stay, it'll always turn bad. When a person reaches a certain point in the intensity of their anger, it's pretty much impossible to pull them down. And the only way they're going to come down is if you are out of there. You are out of there. And you don't want to learn their ways. Look at verse 25, which hooks into that verse. Or you will learn his ways. And you'll find a snare for yourself. Sin is contagious. One fire kindles a second fire, and you develop outbursts of passion, which produces a habit. And a habit morphs into a nature. And a nature can be noxious, and it can be toxic, and it can be deadly. This was siphoned out of the Los Angeles Times. It happened on the, on the east side the other night, the author writes. A man of 55 and his wife quarreled with another driver over a parking spot. Bystanders convinced the police the other driver did not strike a blow. But the 55-year-old punched the driver twice, slugged his wife twice, when she urged him to calm down, he walked 10 steps and dropped dead. It can kill you. Well, that's the negative side. When you're frustrated and furious, now the positive side. Let's say it together. Ready? When you are cool and calm. When you are cool and calm, now, let's look at the first part of some of these verses. Chapter 14, verse 29. Back to chapter 14 of Proverbs and the 29th verse, just the first part. He who is slow to anger has great understanding. The first line of verse 30, a tranquil heart is life to the body. You're at peace. You have plenty of energy during the day. You've slept soundly at night because your heart isn't troubled. You're not tied up in knots over irritation, aggravation, 
or exasperation over something that someone said or did to you. You've learned the secret of just letting it go. Jesus did that in an amazing way. I'm not sure if I put this up on the PowerPoint. We'll see. Yes, let's read it together. For you have been called for this purpose because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example. Now watch how it happens here. So that you would follow in his steps, he who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth, and while being abusively insulted, he did not insult in return. While suffering, he did not threaten. He kept entrusting himself to the one who judges righteously. He was being misused. He was being abused. He was being attacked as he hung from Calvary's tree. Yeah. Was that right? Of course not. Did he have the right to rage at them? You would think so. He could have said, okay, I'm on the cross. I'm dying for sins now, but I'm coming back on Sunday. And when I do, you boys better look out. Let me tell you about Revelation chapter 14, baby. It's going to be real bad. He could have unleashed from the cross all the anger that was there and fried him. But Peter said he chose to do something else, which is the high and holy step. Every time he was reviled, he said, this does not belong to me. I'm going to give it to my father. And he kept entrusting himself. The, the verb in the Greek is it was constant. It was like every second, every time something came, it's for you, father. It's for you, father. It's for you, father. It's not really meant for me. That's why he was able to say, father, forgive them for they what? No, not what they do. And sometimes people are going to get upset at you and you could say, father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And I'm not going to take that to my heart. I'm just going to release it and just going to let it go because it's in the moment, the anger. Um, my dad had a little dog called Spot. It was a strange, weird dog, but everyone in the house hated the dog except my mom. The dog bit every single person that came into that house, but never bit my mom. Had great respect for my mom and great respect for my dad. One day, uh, somebody was tossing a ball, and it landed on a chair, and Spot jumped on the chair to catch it, and he got his paw stuck, and he was hanging from his paw. Now, my dad knew the lovely nature of Spot, which means if he got the paw out, he would probably be bit. But he cared for Spot because he was hurting. I didn't like Spot. I would have left him hanging. <laughs> <laughs> No, I would have got him out because of my mom. All right. So we went over there and released the paw, and Spot bit him. And he picked Spot up and threw him to the plate glass window. No, he didn't do that. <laughs> he realized that was the dog was hurting. He was hurting. That's why he bit him. And so if you could reach the place in your life, and you won't be able to do this all the time, but if you could do it occasionally, when you could be real godly and real spiritual, just like Christ, to occasionally when someone attacks you and you know they're attacking because they're hurting, give them grace. Now, let's make it more practical. If you have a spouse in your house who is hurting, they have constant headaches, they have stomach problems, they have backaches, they are hurting, they are going to be like spot. They're going to snap at you. They're going to want to bite you. But as a wise person in the home, this could be towards your parents, towards your kids, towards your spouse. Realize they're hurting and give them some grace. Amen? That's the godly thing to do. That's exactly what Jesus did. Now, I'm going to share with you two words that work wonders for me. These are miraculous words. Here's the problem. Rick often forgets them. <laughs> now, you may not forget them, so I'm going to give them to you, write them down, put them in your memory book, and use them if you can. 
I don't even know where they came from. I've been thinking about them for about 30 years. I think I just invented the words. I didn't invent them, but I invented them when it comes to using them in pressurized situations. Would you like the special magical words? Yes. Get ready. It's okay. <laughs> but he just pulled, it's okay. But you can't believe what he did to me. It's okay. It's okay. Father loves me. The crisis will pass. I'll get through this pressurized situation. It's okay. And if you could say that and mean it, then you'll experience what Jesus talked about when he said to his men on the eve of his execution in John 14, 27, I give you peace. Not as the world gives, but as I give. So don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let it be fearful. Be at peace. And last week we had our missionaries from uh, Greenland, yes. Daniel and Sove here. Yes. I'm told that if you travel the waters around Greenland, which they have for years, you're going to see these mountainous icebergs towering out of the ocean. They're massive. And then closer to the land, you see smaller ice flows. You've got the ice flows and the icebergs. When you look at them, you see an unusual phenomenon. And that is the ice flows will move in one direction and the icebergs in yet another. And here's the reason. The small ice flows are subject to the surface winds and waves and they move rapidly and erratically. But the huge icebergs are only moved by the deep ocean currents. Remembering that uh, nine-tenths of their mass is below water. Now, God is saying to us today, remember where your mass is at. Remember you're told in 1 Corinthians 3.16 that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The holiest place on the planet is where you're at. The reason this place is sacred today and if we move to another location, it'll be sacred. Is because we're there. You're sacred. You're holy. You're special. You're chosen by God. The word that's used to describe your heart and life is the word naos. And when that word is used in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, to speak of the temple, it doesn't refer to the outer court, it doesn't refer to the holy place. It refers to the holy of holies where the high priest once a year where was able to walk in for a moment and do his duty and get out. It was the holiest place on the planet. You are the holiest place on the planet. I'm going to make a statement. I want you to say that with me. I am the holiest place on the planet. Say it with me. I am the holiest place on the planet. Tell the person next to you, you're not the holiest place. No, no I'm just kidding. <laughs> They're holy too. You tried that, didn't you? No, you're holy too. Okay? So where's your mass? It's below the surface. Remember your mass. You got the strength. You got the power. You have the peace. You have the purpose. Cling to your mass and don't be disturbed by events that destroy the rest of the people who don't have their mass beneath the surface. Be moved by God's great current of love. Chapter 17 and verse 14. The beginning of strife is like letting out water. So... Great wisdom. Abandon the quarrel before it begins. Yes. Yes. Someone has put it this way, and I like this. I don't have to attend every argument I'm invited to. <laughs> Would you like to come to this argument? Not today. Thank you very much. Someone's upset in your, in your home, in your neighborhood, at your place of employment. They're flaming and they're saying, please come, please come and fight with me. No thanks. Not today, not any day. 
And don't create a crisis. Don't be that fire starter like Drew Perrymore. A set of jumper cables walks into a bar. <laughs> the jumper cable says, can I get a drink? The bartender says, OK, but don't start anything. <laughs> You know some people who start things? Man went to visit his pastor about his wife's uncontrollable, explosive anger. He said, I can't deal with her. There's sometimes they come home from work. She starts throwing things at me. Wow, the pastor said. He said, Pastor, I want you to come home today. I want you to see her anger, and then maybe you could counsel both of us. He reluctantly went to the house with the man. They walked up to the house, came to the front door, and here's what the man said. Pastor, wait here for a second. Well, I go in and get her started. <laughs> Can I tell you one of the worst things you could ever do? Is to push and push and push and push and push and push and push. And then to say, oh, what in God's name is wrong with you? <laughs> You're worse than the person who lost their temper. Because you started the quarrel. You started the quarrel. Don't enter into the tension. Don't set it up. Chapter 15, verses 15 to 17. Chapter 15, 15 to 17. All the days of the afflicted are bad. But a cheerful heart has a continual feast. Wow. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than a great treasure and turmoil with it. Better is a dish of vegetables. That's, I didn't say that. He did. I hate vegetables. <laughs> Better is a dish of vegetables where love is than a fattened ox served with hatred. What is he saying? It's not your position or your possessions that provide you with pleasure. It's your peace. It's your peace. You could be happy with very little in life if you know that the Lord loves you and your family and your church loves you. Amen? Amen. And by the way, this church does love you. <laughs> Chapter 15, verse 18. 1518, a hot-tempered man stirs up strife. We know that. We read that. But the slow to anger calms a dispute. He said pretty much the same thing in the first verse of the chapter, one that you've heard of. A gentle anger turns away wrath. A harsh word stirs up anger. Judges chapter 8, 1 to 3, the men of Ephraim are furious at Gideon because they, Gideon has fought against the Midianites and did not invite the people from Ephraim to fight until the very end of the Bible, at the end of the battle. And so the battle ends and they are contending vigorously. The Bible says they're, they're, they had the thumos, they are intense, they're angry at Gideon. Why didn't you invite us to fight earlier in the battle? So they got all this intention, intensity. And Gideon says, well, didn't you key, kill, come some of the key leaders at the end of the battle? Yes. Well, you helped us to achieve a major victory. Congratulations. They said, thank you. In a second, the anger was gone. So there are times, there are moments once you could have a gentle anger, a gentle answer, and it could turn away wrath. But back to the raging and running, I suggest at first, try the gentle answer. And if they're too far gone, put your running shoes on and take off. <laughs> Chapter 19 and verse 11. A man's discretion makes him slow to anger. Watch this. It's his glory to overlook a transgression. Wow. 
when you could do like Jesus did and someone has transgressed, they've stepped over the line is what the Greek and Hebrew word means. They've stepped over the line of what's appropriate. They've been wrong. And you say, I, I just let that go. That gives glory to God. It gives glory to you. To you. Now people see you in a, in a higher state because you said it's not worth getting that upset about. You'll just let it go. Stephen Scott writes, my son Ryan's a running back on his football team. In a recent game, an opposing player threw an intentionally late hit on him. It's a cheap shot. The referee saw it through a flag. When Ryan got back up, I noticed he was grimacing in pain. Five minutes later, the other team had the ball. Ryan was playing defensive end. This time, Ryan made a diving tackle against the same player who made the late hit on him. As the player was lying on the ground, I saw Ryan spit on him and kick him. No. <laughs> I saw Ryan bend down and ask him, are you okay? And then when the player caught his breath, Ryan reached out a hand and helped him on his feet. Stephen writes, during the season, Ryan had made a lot of fine downs and touchdowns and first downs, but that's the moment that made me more proud of him than anything he accomplished the whole season. Ryan's actions were the very picture of Solomon's advice, passing over transgression, passing over it. Chapter 20 and verse 3. I love how Solomon writes, don't you? It almost needs no explanation. It's so clear. 20 and verse 3. Keeping away from strife is an honor for a man, so there's glory and honor. Glory and honor when you don't enter in. But how about this one? Any fool will quarrel. <laughs> no need to be a fool. No need to fuss and fume and lose your cool with the creep who wants to create a crisis. Yes, you could feel your frustration. And you can express it and jot these two words down with tempered intensity. Say that with me. Tempered intensity. I'm angry. That bothered me. I'm feeling hot under the collar right now. I love you, but I don't like you right now. That's all biblical. That's all right. That's all correct. That's all the perfect way to express the anger. You can express it with tempered intensity, but you don't want to let it go too far. Now, over my life, I've had to wrestle with anger issues. There are historical reasons I'm not going to go into today that has created a sense of anger within me. And I've had to look at my anger over the years and deal with it appropriately. Sometimes I get extremely angry. And the Spirit of God says, that was not good. <laughs> Need some damage control. And so I take hat in hand, and first I go to God and say, I'm sorry, Lord. And then I go to the person and say, I'm sorry, would you forgive me? And nine times out of ten, almost ten times out of ten, if people sense that you're honest, yeah. and you're not angry at them all the time, <laughs> Right? They'll forgive you. The reason I know I'm wrong is because I've walked with the Spirit of God for 58 years. And I know when He speaks to me. But watch this. There have been times, especially in the history of all the churches I've pastored, when I have expressed intensified anger under control. Over something wrong that a person has done to God, to another member of this church, to one of my children, or to me. And afterwards, I felt no conviction. 
Do you know why? I was right. So it's possible to do it rightly. It's possible to actually be angry and not have to ask for forgiveness. Just don't go too far. Learn to express it in a way that is helpful. How do I know that I wasn't wrong? Because I didn't hate that person and I had no desire to hurt them. Those are checkpoints. Checkpoints. I love them. I just don't like what they're doing, what they're saying, how they're behaving. So I address it. That's the biblical way to approach it. Christian counselor writes, Christina, 31-year-old lady, sought my help because of deep depression. She was depressed because of her anger. She has two boys, ages 8 and 10, whom she is frequently angry with. John, the 10-year-old, always leaves his bike parked outside the back door. People have to walk around it. Several times, Christina has stumbled over it and fallen. Christina is aware of the anger, and she's confronted John, but she's confronted him by yelling and screaming at him. So she came to me. We talked about setting limits and establishing consequences. By setting limits, I mean determining the difference between behavior that's acceptable and unacceptable. By the term establishing consequences, I mean making a clear statement of what would happen if an unacceptable behavior took place again. Guess what happened? Less than 24 hours after a counseling session, she was carrying a huge box from the house to the garage, and there was John's bike blocking the back door, and she didn't see it. She stumbled and fell and dropped the box. Her adrenaline surged. She yelled at John. Then Christine remembered our session the day before. She cooled down and firmly said, John, I want you to come here. She explained what happened, how she might have injured herself or destroyed the items in the box. And she said, John, I'm taking the box out of the garage to the house. When I get back, I expect the bike to be removed from where it's at. If it's not removed, I will remove it, and then I will lock it up for the next week, and you will not be able to ride it after school, and worse than that, John, you'll have to walk a mile to school and a while back from school without your bike. And this will happen if I ever see it here again. Do you understand me? Yes, ma'am. Christine walked to the garage, watched this. She was amazed at how quickly her angry feelings had subsided. Oh. Normally, this episode would have ruined the rest of her day, but not today. When she came back to the house, the bike was gone, and it never blocked the door again. Express your anger appropriately. Let's bow together, shall we? First John 2, 2 says, Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. The word propitiation in the Greek means the Father was furious at humanity because of our failures. And Jesus took the fury when he died on Calvary for you. Once you accept his sacrifice on your behalf, the Father is not furious with you. He loves you. You're his chosen child. In fact, you could tell someone this week, I'm the most holy place on the planet. <laughs> because you are. If you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior.
If you've never done that, you could do it right now. By simply praying this prayer, and if you mean it from your heart, you'll receive mercy and not madness from the Father. Father, I know that I have broken your commandments and I have failed in many ways. I need forgiveness. I need grace. So I come to the cross and ask that Christ would cleanse me of all that I've done. I will accept his grace for me and I will love you, Father, forever. Thank you for the grace that you've given me. Thank you for the fact that I'm now your son or daughter and I will spend eternity with you forever. Praise you for the fact that I am precious in your sight. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll ask the worship team to come up at this time.